最前沿的科学研究。So just to get this feeling of ah,、oh, I understand something even more, and now I understand even more. It was just so fun. This is Science Rehashed, the podcast where we offer a window into life science research to anyone in the world with an internet connection. I'm Layla, and I'm Mandy, and we are your Science Rehashed co-hosts.、Yeah! We'd like to thank Untapped Resources for sponsoring Science Rehashed. Untapped Resources is a Boston-based foundation that funds the arts, sciences, education, and creative initiatives of people working to improve lives, celebrate community, and solve local problems. With support from the Untapped Resources Grant Program, we are committed to making science more inclusive and accessible for scientists and the science curious worldwide. For this episode, we have interviewed Dr. Maybrit Moser, a Norwegian neuroscientist and psychologist whose work has uncovered the neural underpinnings of some of the most basic aspects of being alive: finding our way, marking the passage of time, and forming memories. In 2014, with her colleagues Edvard Moser and John O'Keefe, Dr. Moser was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for discovering the network of neurons deep in our brain that enable us to navigate our homes, cities, forests, and anywhere else we might find ourselves. Today, Dr. Moser leads the Center for Neural Computation at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Where her team seeks to uncover the neural codes that help us make sense of what our senses tell us. Our talk with Dr. Moser was just so fascinating. We talked about her research, of course, but our conversation also ran the gamut from growing up on a farm to how good science gets done to the baby pink poster that jumpstarted her career. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Moser. It's really a pleasure and honor to have you with us, and I, I, I can't really appreciate it as much as I can say. Yeah, really kind. Thank you for your interest, and、um, I'm very excited what this discussion will result in. Leila, do you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Yeah, sure. So lovely to meet you, Dr. Moser. I'm Leila Siraj. I am an MD PhD student here in Boston、mm -hmm. in the Harvard MIT program. I work on resolving the architecture of non-coding regulatory elements.、Uh, and I was actually just telling Mehdi when I was a med student. We learned about place cells and grid cells and and all of this, and it's so incredible to actually get to talk to you and meet you. So thank you so much. Oh wow! <laughs> so good. And I'm a scientist as well. I'm a faculty member here at Mass General Hospital. My background is bioengineering, but with the focus on Alzheimer's disease these days and other neurodegenerative diseases. Oh, so important! Good to get to know both of you. Well, we are so looking forward to speaking with you. We'd love to start our chat by taking a high-level look at your career path. So, obviously, today you and Edward Moser lead a neuroscience institute at NTNU and seek to understand the neural codes used by the brain to process multi-sensory data into actionable information. But before we talk about what you're doing today, can you step us briefly back and take us through some key moments in your career through your eyes? Both Edward and I started first with mathematics and physics. We decided that our desire to understand the brain is was so strong that、uh, it pushed us to all these professors in the medical faculty, in psychology, and so on, and in biology. And then、uh, finally, we ended up studying psychology because we thought psychologists they have to know about the brain, but they didn't know that much at that time. So then they advised us to contact the medical faculty, and through some other years where we studied only behavior, finally、uh, both of us were accepted as master students with、uh, Pierre Andersen. So he was really essential. So for us to be allowed 
to work with him was a big, big deal for us. And uh, so the career sort of started there, but the interest started, especially for me, when I was a child, uh, I was so interested in behavior and what happens inside us when we decide about doing something, thinking, showing emotions. And Edward, he was more the science person because he got all these books about uh, all these inventors and so on. I heard he's the volcano guy. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I know. Oh, he loves it. And you know what I didn't know, but he told me now so many years after is, is that even before he and I married, we went to Sicily and that was the first time we were exposed to Stromboli, which was exploding in the night. And we were staying there, seeing these explosions every 50 minutes. That is when he became addicted. I didn't know because I was there. So <laughs> I have a follow up question. Where did he propose to you? <laughs> On the volcano, of course. <laughs> <laughs> the Not a surprise at all. <laughs> On the top of Kilimanjaro. Really? <laughs> and it was minus 20 degrees. And I was so mountain sick <laughs> that I was throwing up all the way. And I was just dead. Oh, my God. He's really into it. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's he's an extremely interesting person. So I'm so happy that uh, we have been uh, friends and colleagues for all these years since uh, since we went to high school. Oh, really? Wow. Mm-hmm. We, we went in the same class. Oh, my gosh. That is so sweet. And how fortuitous, right? Like to... <laughs> You know, you've had such an incredible career together and incredible lives together, right? Um, So that's amazing that, you know. And and, and we still have, even though we are divorced and he's married again, Mm -hmm. we are still the best friends. That's amazing. And we have children that we are good parents for. So it's, it's it's a happy life, the two of us live almost together. (laughs) You were saying that you were always interested since you were a child about like brain and behavior and, you know, how we think about things and how that gets translated to action. Can you tell us more about that, that interest, how it started, what it was like in your childhood? Yeah, so I'm from a non-academic family. So I was raised on a farm in a small island at the west coast of Norway. And we had a lot of nature, but we also had a lot of schools and we had a lot of visitors coming to this place. So I was exposed to many different people and to animals. And I saw the choices that people and animals did. And I had, uh, especially in the summer, because we were too poor to have a car, So my friends, they would go for holidays and I stayed home at the farm. So I had a lot of time to just sit there and use my fantasy and play with uh, animals and so on. And, you know, when you can do that and be happy with yourself, then you start to get all these ideas. So people would call me the professor because I had all these questions. And when I came to school and I found out that my teachers could answer questions that I didn't get answers to before. I was just, give it to me. <laughs> so it was just, I need to know more. I, no, I need to know how this works. Then so you went to school, right? And you had, you know, for the first time you were sort of exposed to like, this is an actual career path and people who could give me answers. Can you tell us about some of the challenges that you encountered as a young scientist, as a young researcher with these ambitious goals and how you kind of navigated your way. That's so exciting because um, I think I was sort of naive and blind. So uh, the challenges, if they existed, they would be more motivators for me Mm -hmm. because I was so naive that I I didn't think that uh, such hindrance should be affecting me Uh because I had, if you understand me, that I was crazy or something but it was just that I thought that this just has to work why shouldn't it Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
this is also a question that I have realized afterwards is very important for other females. Because I, tomorrow I will give a talk in China that I just had to prepare before I came here. Mm -hmm. So I sent off the slides about uh, women in science. And I haven't been thinking too much about it because I have been too naive and I've been too lucky, sort of. But then when I started to think about it, then I realized that we have all these fantastic role models around that made me self-confident. It, it shouldn't matter if I'm a man or a woman or I, I should do my best as a scientist, not not to show off or to be decorated, but because I really want to get the answers to my questions. And we are back to the curiosity. <laughs> yes. and, that's what, and, and that's what will get us moving every day as scientists in the labs. Exactly. I was going to say that resonates so much with me. You know, I, similar to you, I come from a family not in academia at all. Um, but in, in my family, my mother studied math and became an architect after that. So she's very precise and very mathematical. And I loved and math and science. And I had all these questions in school. And so when I was in high school, I remember one of my teachers, you know, asking, oh, which of you love math and science? And I raised my hand. I said, oh, which of you love history and whatever? And I also raised my hand, <laughs> you know, because I loved everything. And I remember my teacher saying, wow, so, like, you know, it's nice to see so many women who are interested in math and science. And I was like, well, of course they are. Why not? Exactly. You know? Why wouldn't we be? Exactly. So that is what, that was my reaction too, because when I studied physics at the university, one, one of uh, the female professors, uh, or she was uh, just an assistant, she came to me and she said, do you want to join the female club? And I said, what? Why should I do that? I don't want to be with all the other ones in the class. I don't want to be picked out and treated special. Yeah, yeah. But but now I understand, mm -hmm. even though I, I didn't realize that it was special to, to be interested in mathematics and physics for a woman, um, I still see that some people also need protection and good role models. So I'm much more humble and wiser today than I was because I was <laughs> yeah and you were just so focused and and you were like you know these yeah. are the questions I want to answer I'm going to answer it however I can right but now exactly. you can reflect and sort of see all these challenges exactly so it reminds me about when I had to learn um, so a carpenter has to learn to use these uh, machines and so on and in school we had one class that we could choose either that or knitting and I knew knitting because my dad had trained me to knit. So then I went to these machines because my dad was a carpenter and I wanted to learn more his tools and, and his way of working. And I went to the teacher and I said, I want to learn about these machines. And he was just looking at me and said, what? Are you crazy? A, a girl? And I said, why not? Yeah, you have long hair. And then I said, have you heard about hair nets? And <laughs> it's just, but he refused. And that was such a surprise to me because why should it matter? Yeah, it's like your story resonates with a lot of us, I'm sure, and with a lot of listeners after listening to this episode. You mentioned that we always looking for a role model. Sometimes I think the role model also comes from the family. In my case, I was like the first gen to go to the, to the university to study and doing research. My mother was a housewife, never was educated because of several reasons that it's out of the scope of this episode. But she always taught me either you go to the school, you do science and you become independent and you become someone that will get respected and help make the world better. Or the other options are not going to discuss that, what's going to happen. <laughs> so at any point in your life, your, your, your parents play that big role, even sometimes just by saying, oh, you're going to become a housewife. If you don't study very hard and you go to How the school. How did you know? 
<laughs> so, so, you know, uh, uh, my mom was also a housewife. And sometimes she had some small jobs, but uh, but uh, but she also had the farm, and she was looking after five children, even though I was the youngest. And um, she really wanted to become a doctor, but she couldn't afford it. And uh, she had all these books, and she loved to understand, and she had all these discussions and so on. And then she saw my talent somehow, I think, that, and also how eager I was and how curious I was. So I think she knew that if I should be happy, I needed to be a place where I could learn. But then, you know, when you are a young girl in a small place, then there are other things that also drag your attention away from, from school. And I told her, uh, I don't want to do this or that. And then she said exactly that. Okay, if you don't want to do this, it's no problem, but you can just apply to the housewife school. And I said, no way, no way. If there's something <laughs> And it wasn't that I didn't like to make food and such things. I love that. And I was really uh, fond of uh, of children because I, I was an aunt when I was four and so on. So, so it wasn't that. But to just be a housewife and then to be blocked from learning and doing things, to explore things, no way. So she knew what to tell me for sure. If you're enjoying the show and want to help us keep making content, please consider becoming one of our patrons on Patreon. Find us at patreon.com slash join slash science rehashed to become a patron for just $3 a month or a VIP patron for $5 a month. Our first 10 VIP patrons will receive a free Science Rehash water bottle. What's cooler than that? And so then you, I, I, I will call the Mosers, mm-hmm. two scientists, inspiring scientists with one mission. You both were fortunate to get into the same school, correct? Uh, for your undergrad, and also you were fortunate to to, to go to the same lab uh, for your master thesis, and then follow up with for your PhD dissertation. Let's start where you you shifted from psychology to neuroscience uh, to like it's it's very kind of different fields and. Uh, having different kinds of people doing this science in psychology and neuroscience, uh, how you made that shift from your undergrad? Uh, because both these two kind of scientists, those the fields are related, but quite different approaches to answer questions about being human. So how you made that transition? Well, and also I have an add-on to that. Well, you were studying physics, right? Like, how did you even go from physics to, to all of that? Oh, don't complicate it, Leila. <laughs> I'm making it complicated. I'm so curious. <laughs> it's already a very complicated story. <laughs> it feels like you are the people who understand my dilemmas in life. Because to be in mathematics and even going from mathematics to physics was a step because mathematicians don't want to speak to people studying physics and so on because they're so different people. And then going from this place in the same small area in Oslo at Blinnan where I studied, go crossing <laughs> to the neighbor house where they studied psychology and, and uh, sociology and all these things. I needed Edward, I have to say that, to have the courage to do it because it was so different. And it's it's crazy that I felt it like that, but it was, it was really different. But there was no shift. It was a morph. And the way we morphed it is that because we are clinical psychologists, that is, so we are allowed to practice. We, we have this letter from the king, you can practice, <laughs> like doctors. Um, so, I, so I, I love that in Norway, everything comes from the king to get permission. <laughs> of course. 
course, we love our king. <laughs> no objection. <laughs> yeah, so what happened then uh, was that when we just started to study psychology, we went to one of the professors in psychology and then we worked with him. But he worked at the medical faculty so that we worked in the night uh, with him and then we're proper students during the daytime. And then when we didn't believe in the models that he could provide us, then we went two months to Sweden and we were not happy there either. And then the professor in Sweden said, the last hope you have to be happy is to go back to Pierre Andersen. And then since we knew it was our last hope, I remember it was like I had super glue on my clothes. So I was just stuck to the chair and I told them, I'm not going to leave this room before you accept us as a master's student. And wow. in fact, we want to take a PhD with you too, just so that you are prepared. And he was just, <laughs> what are these people? And then he wow. said, since we are trained in behavior from psychology, then he had had a dream about merging behavior and his uh, knowledge about the brain so that he wanted us to build a water mess lab for him so that he could start to address the questions that had been pushing him uh, to think about how is long-term potentiation related to behavior. And we thought that was fantastic. But so he printed out um, a paper from uh, Richard Morris in Edinburgh, and he said, if you can make such a lab, you are allowed to do a master thesis in my lab. So you have to become a mechanical engineer first and then tr transition to a neuroscientist. So, and he had just built himself a sailing boat and he said, just build the water maze, two meter in diameter. But I had been trained also as a neuropsychologist. So I knew that my brain shouldn't have this exposure to all this plastic and these fumes. So I said, I'm going to, to get it. So I threw some connections. I could buy uh, the water maze and we put it up and we designed things and showed him, look here, we can get this to work. And he was so impressed. So... And, and then I, I just have to say that because, as you said, at that time we were married. Um, we came uh, from, then we had the same supervisor. We lived in Oslo. In, in Norway at that time, it was uh, an extreme egalitarian system so that money should be flat over in Norway. And we even worked on the same brain structure. Edward more with physiology and I more with anatomy. We worked on hippocampus. And then we wrote our grant proposals, Edward and I, and well, we asked if we could be allowed to submit that to the research council. And Pierre said, no way that both of you would get this. And then he said, you have to choose who is going to do physiology and then I can help the other. And uh, then I said, Edward can take the physiology. I, I'm interested in other things. And then he said, OK, um, you can do that. But then you have to do this and that. And I said, no way. I'm going to do what I believe in. I'm a psychologist. I believe that the brain is plastic. And I want to see the spines exploding after learning. And he said, she's crazy. And I went back and forth uh, to, to, to his office in two months with my application. And finally, he just gave in. And he said, OK, now both of you can just submit these grants. I can write a support letter. And the two grants they had that year, that went to Edward and me. That's amazing. That is incredible. But you see, well, again, we were just driven by, they call it passion, but I would say that uh, sometimes uh, I feel a bit insane because I'm, I'm not anchored to reality <laughs> as I should. But that gives some opportunities because suddenly you can get things to work that normal people wouldn't get because I wouldn't try. Or we, 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 we call them maybe non-scientists instead of normal people. <laughs> because then we will be abnormal. <laughs> All of us. 
pretty crazy. <laughs> and the that's outliers. where you, you <laughs> the out well, obviously. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and that's where you started working on the dorsal and the ventral parts of the hippocampus and the connection to the memory. Can you a little bit walk us through that? And that was early in your studies, master thesis. That's unbelievable how curious you were. It, it was so interesting. And, and thank you for bringing up this because it's so old that normal people have forgotten this history. So, so the idea... Per Andersen had was that he would get rid of the dorsal and the ventral part of both hippocampi and then there would be just a slice left in the brain of the animals and then he would train and train in the water maze and then see LTP in a natural situation because there was such a tiny tissue to search for LTP. And it was a brilliant idea, but since we were trained as psychologists, then we had to know what happens if you take away the dorsal part, what happens if you take away the ventral part, and we measured because we wanted to to know how much you could take away and all these things. And then we had a poster, and of course that was baby pink, because my supervisor hated pink. So, <laughs> see, see, see this. <laughs> so he, he but the silver me. lining will bring attention from the people <laughs> passing by the poster. Exactly. exactly. I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but it was beautiful. It was really beautiful. And Edward accepted that we could go with baby pink. He loved pink too. Oh my gosh. <laughs> And, and of course, it was easy for people to spot that pink poster. And they knew that it, <laughs> this was from Per Andersen's group, who was uh, at that time uh, an international capacity because of the LTP and, and the slice and, and uh, the interview work that he had worked on. And, and then he had these super friends around in the world and they could come to Oslo to visit him like Eric Kandel, Larry Squire, Sir John Eccles, Grant, all these, uh, Edmund Tulving, all these top, top people would come to their uh, their friend <laughs> Per Andersen and they would see this pink poster hanging in the corridor. <laughs> <laughs> so Eric uh, Kandel, he asked Pierre, uh, am I allowed to ask your students to present the poster and say, yeah, go, and, go and, and talk to them, that's okay. And we did. And Eric said, wow, this is so exciting. You have to publish. Wow. And, and Pierre, what? I don't want to publish, blah, blah, blah. But then finally, Eric convinced him, publish. And we published it in Journal of Neuroscience, and it's one of the most well-cited work we have. And then we presented it on a conference in Sweden, the beautiful pink poster, and uh, Richard Morris came by, and he saw the water maze, and he saw this, and then he said, I have a friend, Len Gerard, he knows how to make such lesions in a much better way so that you, you spare the fibers, uh, you can use the botanic acid instead of aspiration lesions, and just see if you find the same thing. And we were invited to go to his lab to do that, so we brought our tiny little daughter with us. His, uh, Richard's wife was looking after our daughter and uh, their daughter. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So, 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 and again, everything worked out and we worked like crazy and uh, it was good fun. If you're enjoying this episode, join the conversation with us on Twitter at Science Rehashed, where we will be rehashing this episode. Don't forget to follow us on all of our social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Science Rehashed to stay in the loop about our new episodes and upcoming interviews. So Dr. Moser, you and Edward and John O'Keefe were awarded the 2014 Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology. Can you tell our listeners about the day you found out? Yeah, so that was also uh, very, very exciting because Edward was just on the plane to Munich to uh, our friend uh, Tobias Bornhofer. So I was alone with the lab 
with the lab meeting. And I was sitting there after the presentation uh, where they presented, um, it was one of uh, our PhD students who presented the 11 room experiment. And I was so excited and this, mm -hmm. and then I got a phone call and I was so irritated. And my communication officer, she knows how I am. I'm, I'm, I'm normally very kind, but when I'm irritated, then I'm, I'm not so nice. And I was irritated because this phone was ringing and ringing. And I was so into this uh, discussion about the data that was so exciting. And then somehow I, 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 I had this intuition that maybe, maybe it, it's worthwhile to be a bit polite. You can take the phone and just say you are in a meeting and then uh, you can go back and enjoy science. <laughs> So I, I went, a true scientist. <laughs> yeah, and I went out of, of the room and I heard this uh, Swedish voice and he said, please go to your office. This is serious. And I was, who are you? Tell me that I should go to my office. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I didn't say that. I was just thinking that. And then I went to my office and he said, calm down, close your door, sit down. <laughs> oh my gosh maybe he needs your comment on other Nobel Prize winner <laughs> <laughs> that is what I thought exactly that is what I thought okay uh, I understood that it was uh, in Sweden I suddenly realized that it was the 6th of October that means that they would advertise the Nobel Prize and then I thought oh if if it's a Nobel Prize winner that I don't know that well that I should have known oh. well, and I I was just oh my God. why why are you coming into all these uh, terrible situations? And then he said, just calm down, uh, relax, and you should get a cup of coffee so that you are calm. And I said, no way, I'm not going. I I don't have time. I have people waiting for me? Tell me, <laughs> go for it. And then he said. Uh, you and Edward won the Nobel Prize. Um, and he also <laughs> said, John. And I said, are you joking with me? What is this? And then I said to him, you know, um, I don't trust you. Can you please send me an email so I can read it? Because I don't I don't trust my ears. This is this is too wild to be true. And then he sent wow. me this email. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and John O'Keefe and Edward Moses have won the Nobel Prize. I was what? Oh and God. now you have 15 minutes uh, before we announce it. Then there will be a lot of journalists uh, coming and interviewing you. And I said, do you know where we live? We live the, in the outermost place in the world. So there will be maybe one journalist <laughs> if we are lucky. And then suddenly uh, I also went to, because he said he, I wasn't allowed to say anything, but then I felt I have to tell my boss, the dean. Mm -hmm. So I went to him and I said, do you know? And he managed to get the communication officer, not Rita, but uh, the other one, from her meeting so that we had five minutes in his office so that she got the news. And then she sent out messages. We need champagne. We need people <laughs> to meet in the meeting room. And somehow they got champagne. And when I came out of the dean's office, it was like going in a bee swarm. Wow. It was just crazy with all these people and journalists and people from the lab <laughs> who had got to know. And I didn't believe my eyes. And then we came up in the fifth floor and I had to talk with the prime minister. I had to talk to the chair of NATO, Jan Stoltenberg, <laughs> because he had been here when he was a prime minister. And I was just, what is this? This is so crazy. And then we couldn't get in touch with Edward because he was in the Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> what an incredible set of events. I can't believe, like, you were getting this call from the Nobel Prize Committee and you were just, it didn't even cross your mind. You were just like, what if they ask me about someone? I don't know. <laughs> That's amazing. And he was just like, I just want to get back to the science. Let's take the call and let's finish. Exactly. So it was just, uh, so yeah. But then when I got to know, then I suddenly, because I'm, I'm a very emotional person and 
uh, when I got to know, then I suddenly was dancing. Wow. So the communication <laughs> people here at NTNU, they put um, uh, um, uh, Harry Williams uh, happy uh, as the tone that I was dancing. <laughs> and it, it would fit so beautifully. So I can send you the link. It's on YouTube. And it's just crazy. I was feeling me you. <laughs> You won the Nobel Prize for discovering grid cells and their role in navigation. Can you briefly explain for our listeners what a grid cell is and what it does? Yeah, so if we can jump just a tiny bit to to the history first, because as I said, we also went to Edinburgh to learn to do this uh, lesions, hypotenic acid lesions. And we could also, in the end, add on one month in London to learn to record single units from the hippocampus. Uh So when we went back home to, to Norway, we had this urgent question with us. Where is this spatial information coming from that we see in the hippocampus? Then we recorded them in the dorsal uh, dorsal medial part of the entorhinal cortex, which is directly coupled to the dorsal hippocampus. And in the hippocampus, a place cell is typically active in only one part of an environment. But what we saw when we recorded the entorhinal cortex, we saw that there were multiple fields of activity. So when the animal is running around in the box, then in that place and this place and this place. And these fields were so regular uh, and uh, it was, uh, you could fit in equilateral triangles on this pattern uh, of activity. And that led us to think about that these grid cells could function like a metric, like a coordinate system, and it was so precise. And that led us again to ask questions, how is this possible in biology? This is crazy. Because to be so precise, and these cells are so deep in the brain, and still being so precise... And then we were so lucky that we had the best postdocs in the world, of course, to work with us to check whether we had speed cells in this area and to to check uh, if uh, you also had some head direction. And then you can use that information to get uh, to generate this pattern. So just to get this feeling of, ah, I understand something even more. And now I understand even more. It was just so fun. That's absolutely incredible. I remember learning about grid cells and how spatial information is encoded in med school. And I remember uh, they were telling us about um, London cab drivers where you're not allowed to use a GPS, right? You have to have mm-hmm. this map in the in the back of your head. They're trained for more than three years yes, exactly. before they get the, the license. All this specialized <laughs> knowledge. I can't imagine what the grid in their hippocampi looks like. You know what I mean? Exactly. Hi, listeners. If you're enjoying Science Rehashed, let us know by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts. Rate our show on Spotify by tapping the three dots next to the following button and then tapping rate show. This is also a great time to hit follow if you're not following already. We have sort of a little bit of out there question. You know, you've talked about this sort of burning desire to understand how our brains map out our experiences, right? And you've done all this work, right, as a neurologist. How has your work as a neuroscientist affected your perspective as, you know, a human being who's also moving through space and time and mapping out this world around you? How's how's your work impacted that? Oh, that's a very exciting question because people who know me, they know that I struggle with both time and space. (laughs) <laughs> so, and in psychology we were joking about people study psychology because they want to learn about themselves and I had to go deeper so I had to learn more about time and space <laughs> so but what it taught me is that when people normal people even though I say I'm insane and, and strange and so on I think of myself as a normal person with a normal brain 
And in my normal brain, the grid cells and the head direction cells and all work. Even if they are working really well, still I'm lost many times. And that means that I have to sort out, where is this coming from? Why am I so bad finding my way when I have all this equipment in my brain? And then it's easier to think about what happens when I walk around. I have to pay attention. And what do I pay attention to? People, animals, cars, uh, things that you can't use to navigate. Because then you need stable landmarks. You need to know where the sun is so that you can orient yourself when it comes to north and east and so on. And I didn't pay attention to that. And then you get lost. And that was such a comfort for me. And I pet my shoulders and said, oh, my bitch, you will be fine one day. You can just pay attention. And then I got the dog and I have to run around with my dog and we have to find a way back to our house. <laughs> so <laughs> now I pay attention <laughs> to, to stay for landmarks. <laughs> I'm going to a little bit shift gears here. You mentioned about dancing and also you mentioned about playing in childhood and the curiosity. Uh, we would love to hear more about how really good science gets done in your unique experience. You have talked about the importance of playing, uh, dancing, childlike curiosity. And also I quote you, in one place, you said, when you have questions that you really wonder how to address, it's important that you can play. Mm. What do you mean by play in the context of scientific research? So first of all, I think that if we go even further out and take a meta perspective here, the curiosity uh, and passion together are driving this craziness for the questions. But questions are of no value in science if you can't operationalize them. So you have to break them down to questions that can be addressed. And when they can be addressed, you need methods that can address them and technology. And that has always, and you also need theory to frame them so that uh, you, you, so, 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 for example, when, when we discover the torus, why is it interesting to have a torus in your brain? It's interesting because uh, computer models have suggested that the grid cells would be generated uh, as a continuous network, and then you would get a torus. And if we could show a torus with uh, mathematical methods like topology, and, and uh, that. So now I'm jumping. I, I, I know that. But what is important is that you have the theory, you have the questions that you can break down, and there should be big general questions so that you don't end up in a niche. And if you have these big questions, then it will be very exciting. And if you are blessed like me to work with the best people in the world, developing technology and so, for example, that we were allowed to join the collaboration with uh, Janelia Farm and all the others for developing your pixel probes so that you could go from recording, say, at the maximum 10 grid cells at the same time to over 1,000. And that's crazy. And the tiny mini 2P microscope that we were allowed to work with these genius uh, engineers that could develop, like Vejan Song, who developed and got this to work in moving, behaving animals. And then again, not only can we listen to cells and see cells, but we know exactly where they are and we can look at them and we can recognize them and we can visit the same cells over days, over weeks. And that, that makes us able to address questions that we can do before. And when we were students, of course, we had all these dreams of all the things that you could do um, if we had the technology, if we had the methods. And suddenly, we have, and it's just crazy. And then you get even more eager to use these methods 
and to understand more. Dr. Moser, it has been an absolute delight talking with you about your journey from Western Norway to the top of your field, to the inner workings of the brain. As you look to the future, what are the most important gaps in the picture that you, Edward, and the rest of your peers have been painting over the years? And what do you most hope to learn? So, of course, you, you have very, very general questions. And they are so general that we wouldn't go into these questions for many decades. But in the next decade, we have just got now a new grant, which is called the Center of Excellence for 10 years. And in these 10 years, people at our institute will, in a quality way, try to reveal the algorithms of cortex and also see if different cortical structures will solve their questions, their intellectual functions, the same way as, for example, we see that the cortex is solving its question about how to generate grid cells, how do they work together, who are the grid cells talking to, and so on. And now we have techniques where we can go in, for example, with the microscope, to stimulate cells and then say, hey, I'm stimulated, I'm talking to you. And then you can start to map networks in a completely new way. And if you can do this in, in different cortical areas, I think we can learn so much. So that's one thing. And then, of course, you have this huge bag, which we call development. Mm -hmm. And how is this all wired? through development. And then at our place, we have both groups working on uh, functional MRI so that we can take our questions to humans. So the professor working here on these questions, he would typically say, I'm going to translate the findings and your questions to humans, not to clinics, but to humans. And then we can also translate from humans to clinics. So it's an uh, extremely exciting time. I have one more question that we ask all our guests. When you're not doing science, what do you do in your spare time? Can you see the other screen here? No. That would have been fantastic if you could. Um, no, we can't. Um, like oh, this? here we go. <laughs> now we can. Uh, oh my gosh, that's our dog. <laughs> Who is this? This is this is Fado. And you know, Fado is a Portuguese uh, music. It's the Portuguese blues. So it's, uh, they're so sad when uh, people left them going on the boats and they're uh, singing these most beautiful, sad songs. He's the opposite. Oh. He's happy, 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 happy. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> but he's still called Fado. And, uh, of course, I need to run him. So we were running in the forest. So I was preparing my lecture to China this morning. Then I was running with uh, Fado up in the forest, and then I came here. That's wonderful. <laughs> Sounds like a pretty great day. It was wonderful. Uh, I, we can talk for hours, if not days. It's so fascinating chatting with you and the discussion. It's so lovely to have you. Again, thank you so much for, for giving us the honor to have you in our show and talking to you. Well, that was a fascinating conversation with Dr. Moser. How inspiring to hear about the sheer persistence that enabled her to forge a new research path and make these transformative discoveries in science. And her perspectives on the prerequisites for good science can surely help other researchers to follow in her footsteps. Listeners, don't miss our next episode. And speaking of footsteps, if you need an inspiring pick-me-up, you have to watch Dr. Moser's Noble Dance on YouTube. Thank you for listening to another episode of Science Rehashed. This episode was written by Ben Allen and sound edited by Aaron Proudman. The cover art for this episode was made by our creative director, Emma Brandt. We would also like to thank the whole team of Science Rehashed for making this episode possible. 